call to order the March 16th Suburban County Board of Commissioners meeting. Please rise to a moment of silence and pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, I'd be looking for an approval of the regular meeting proposed agenda. Chair. Motion made by Commissioner Schmeezing and seconded by Commissioner Barant. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. And then moving on to the consent agenda. Looking for a motion then to approve the consent agenda as presented. Madam Chair, I'll move approval as presented. Motion made by Commissioner Foby, seconded by Commissioner Barant. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. And that motion carries. All right, moving on to our next item of business, we have announcements. Bruce, do you have some announcements for us, please? <laughs> Thank you, Chair Danielowski. Just a couple quick announcements. Uh, we'll be doing the COVID update and handle some facilities issues there as well. Uh, in the board packet for correspondence, we have several items uh, of note for the board. In addition, after uh, the board meeting uh, last time, we did receive official responses from MnDOT on two speed study requests. So I've handed those out. They're not in the packet, but will be included in official correspondence. Uh, and then, uh, Question for the board, I guess, is uh, that the request of the board, we did put together some appointment letters. You have templates in there, so if any of you have comments or suggestions, uh, we'll be meeting with the department heads this afternoon, and the goal is to elevate any board appointments. will be uh, handled by the clerk's office, and we'll make sure that thank you letters go out and appointment letters go out as well. So unless the board has any significant uh, discussion on that topic, we'll just proceed as, as directed uh, earlier to get those done. Any comments or thoughts then? Everybody have a chance, look good? Okay. Good, and we'll, uh, we'll make some of those retroactive already. So for instance, the airport authority appointments uh, and thank you letters to the two other applicants who did not uh, be appointed to the airport authority. And then uh, for board information today, very briefly, Dave Unzi is going to uh, give you a quick virtual tour. Uh, this is a project that you had authorized a couple of months ago and we have it pretty much up and ready here. Morning, commissioners. Good morning. Uh, we added this feature to our website, just hopefully to help people navigate uh, the government center a little bit better, particularly after the renovation uh, that happened recently. So um, this is a 360 virtual tour of the facility. You can find the link to it on the main web page, which we'll leave there for a while. Uh, it'll be easy to find and prominently displayed on the web page. It starts with a little bit explaining how to navigate the page. In the upper right hand corner there's a drop down that you can be basically taken immediately to a department that you uh, want to see. Um, clicking on the arrows takes you down the hall. I'm um, not going to run through the entire tour but uh, you kind of get the sense of how you can navigate around the government center. Um, at certain spots, there's information boxes that tell you essentially what's in here or a link to the department's website. Um, several other features that you can find along the way. So uh, check it out when you can. We hope it helps educate people about what's here and where things are so when they visit, their visit is efficient as it can possibly be. Looks good, Dave. Thank you. Yeah, it's a very nice product, and, and uh, please take a look at it, see what you think. We've done a couple of modifications to make it more intuitive. Uh, and thank you also, commissioners, for allowing us to put this together. 
On that note, I just also wanted to note uh, at the end of your agenda is future uh, meetings, and we are scheduling a series of workshops that the board requested. One is on communication strategy, specifically the question of, of print communication and possibly mailing it to all, um, all audiences. So Dave is putting together that for the next board meeting, the first one in April. Uh, in addition, the board had requested a review of the fee schedule uh, for 2021. So we'll be bringing that uh, back as well. And then the second meeting in April, we do have scheduled a discussion uh, again on the board of adjustment. And that's uh, all for announcements for now. All right. Thank you. Okay, at this moment in time, we're going to have our open forum. Anybody wishing to address the board um, would have signed up in the back of the room. Keisha, is there anybody? There is nobody signed up, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. And moving on to our regular agenda, um, at the moment we will have the introduction of the new law librarian. Kathy, welcome. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Um, as you know, the Sherman County Law Libraries consists of five different individuals. Commissioner Foby is our present um, trustee for the board. It is a statutorily created entity, and we recently hired Ben, and I'd like him to introduce himself to you and tell you a little bit about the law library services. Thank you. Welcome, Ben. Is it um, Rydland? Ridland, yeah. Ridland, okay, thank you. Good morning, thank you for Good your morning. time. Good um, morning. Yeah, I just wanted to introduce myself, Benjamin Ridland, uh, taking over from uh, Annette Borer, uh, who did a fine job uh, preparing the law library for me before I came. Um, yeah, so what we're doing right now is we're just doing um, reference services a lot for a lot of uh, patrons that um, need forms or um, need to be referred to an attorney or something like that. Um, and I've also been offering some computer and technology assistance uh, that I've carried over from my previous post at the East Central Regional Library um, with anything from Microsoft Word to uh, we, with Westlaw and things like that. Um, and I've also been doing some outreach to local uh, organizations such as um, the y, YMCA and um, Senior Activity Center or Senior Center and a few different churches, trying to get them to uh, let their um, their congregation and their uh, their members know that we're open and we're ready to serve them. So um, I'm hoping that the numbers start picking up for sure. But yeah, I just wanted to let you guys know that we're we're all going and um, hoping that we can get a few more people in day to day. Yeah, I'm thinking that when things start to loosen up like they're doing, we'll probably have more people out and about and yeah. getting back into, on average, what have we had in the past? Um, in, my, in my time here, which has been about a month, we have on average four people between calling and um, people coming in. So and prior COVID? What were the numbers prior to COVID um, participation? I'm not completely okay. familiar with that. All right. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, what hours are you staffed now? Uh, I'm here uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Oh, okay. That's a pretty good schedule. Yep. Okay. Any other questions for Ben? Oh, just welcome, Ben. Yep. Thank yes, you. Thank I you. Appreciate welcome it. on board. Thank you. All right, our next item on the agenda is the update on the Midco brand broadband activities in Sherburne County. Melissa, good morning. Hi. Morning. And does this control? Okay, perfect. <clears throat> well, thank you um, so much to the board and to uh, Dan Weber for helping coordinate this. Uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity to be here and present to you today. My name is Melissa Wolf, and I am the um, government relations manager with Midco here in Minnesota. Um, so I know you guys are all pretty much aware of uh, who Midco is. We've been doing a lot of expansion in the in the county over the last year, but I don't think anyone has ever been in here to kind of just give a brief history of you know who Midco is and what we do. So I thought I would kind of uh, go through that, and then you know most importantly provide you an update on the expansion we did in 2020 and what we're looking at for 2021 and beyond. Um, so hopefully I'm doing that right. There we go. Um, 
so as you can see on this slide, um, Midco is a rural broadband provider. We have a, uh, throughout the Midwest, we have a five state footprint. That's Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wisconsin, and Kansas. Um, our mission is really to innovate for, empower, and inspire the people of the Midwest. Um, one very interesting fact about Midco is of the four largest cable companies in the state of Minnesota, um, Midco is the only Minnesota-born broadband provider. As you can see on the slide, we um, started out in the 1930s uh, in Minneapolis as the Wellworth Theater Company, um, as it was well worth your dime to attend the theater. And really, as, um, as uh, technology grew and innovated, Midco grew and innovated with it. So from the theater, we went to radio, to TV, and then in the 90s, we got involved in this crazy thing called the internet. Um, and so we have been a broadband provider for well over 20 years. Um, in 2018, we actually invired, uh, acquired a company called Invisimax, and we st started offering a fixed wireless product. And then uh, in 2020 and continuing in 2021, um, Midco has made significant investments in strengthening our core footprint. Um, and as such, all of Midco's new builds, uh, wireline builds, builds will be uh, fiber directly to the home. Um, and that brings our fiber deeper uh, into our network. Um, and lastly, just wanted to mention that we are still headquartered in Edina, and we have about 200 employees in the state of Minnesota. Um, about 1,700 employees uh, across our footprint, but 200 are here in the state. Melissa, I had a question. Yeah. Um, what, what, um, to make, where do you decide when you're going to invest? Is it, do you do some marketing and get people to be interested, or how, how do you figure you want to invest in the different areas that you're... Well, so I think that takes on a lot of different variables, and we are, uh, we look well into the future. I mean, we're not, um, you know, 2021 uh, was finalized, you know, well before 2021 got here. We're looking out through 2023 and 2025. Uh, at investment opportunities. Um, certainly it depends on how close, you know, areas are to our network, our infrastructure, um, because that's the, you know, the biggest cost is getting our infrastructure further out. Um, population density, growing areas, um, you know, the communities that we already serve, um, obviously we're invested in and we, you know, want to continue that investment and to grow with those communities. So those are all factors okay. um, in, in our investment. Um, opportunities, I guess. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. And feel free to interrupt me um, at any point. Um, so Midco is really dedicated to bringing our customers the, the best connectivity possible. Um, fiber is really the backbone for all of our uh, innovation, including fixed wireless. Um, we currently have over 10,500 network fiber miles, and that is only growing. I actually think that that number is out of date right now. <laughs> Um, and we are actually the only wholly owned, engineered, and operated network in our region. Um, our current network is about 95% fiber, and that is only increasing. We do have multiple delivery methods, um, um, including fiber, hybrid fiber, and fixed wireless. These are all tools in our toolbox um, to best serve our customer, and we really do look at the technology that does best serve that customer, that end user. Uh, lastly, across our footprint, we have over 440,000 customers in all five states. Here in Minnesota, we serve over 176 Minnesota communities and connect over 161,000 Minnesota homes. Um, so most importantly, to talk a little bit about Sherburne County. So um, in 2020, we began our expansion in Sherburne County. Um, and in 2020, we um, laid over 1 million feet of broadband infrastructure throughout the county. Um, so that included fiber and uh, coaxial cable. We connected over 5,000 new passings, and uh, for uh, so understanding the jargon, a passing could be a home, a business, a school, a farm, any location. Um, we do have a little bit of carryover uh, from our 2021 expansion or 2020 expansion into 2021. So we will be um, laying about 10,500 feet. Um, a fiber on the north side of Lake Anne, and we'll connect another 104 passings that should be done this spring. All of these, um, all of these homes, residents have access to gig speeds, along with, um, you know, Midco offers cable TV services and uh, phone services as well. So into 2021, all of Midco's 2021 projects in Sherburne County will be fiber directly to the premise. 
Um, these, uh, this fiber directly to the premise is capable of five gigabit symmetrical speeds. Um, so this, uh, just for a little bit of context, these are among the fastest speeds in the state currently. Um, we will be connecting uh, Bailey Township this year with about 619 new passings and Monticello with about 334 new passings. Construction should begin in April and run through August, but of course, weather dependent on that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, you know, that we've been working on in 2021 with um, the county and, and your public works and, and Dan and with our construction team is a conduit lease agreement. Um, certainly, MIDCO has looked at that as a great opportunity to partner with the county. Um, it has provided us a lot of cost savings, um, and that just means that instead of spending money on um, running infrastructure, we can actually spend that on deploying broadband. Um, so to talk a little bit about, and I do have a, um, a map coming up, so all of this will make sense in just a second. <laughs> Um, MIDCO has also participated in federal uh, grant programs through the FCC to deploy broadband. So the most recent um, auction that we took, uh, participated in was called RDOF. I'm not sure if, if you are familiar, but um, just a little bit of history. RDOF stands for the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund. This was a reverse auction that took place last fall through the FCC. Um, MIDCO was awarded um, just under $900,000 in Sherburne County, and we will connect over 1,600 homes, businesses, and farms um, through that auction. Um, the locations included uh, in that, uh, those eligible areas were Clear Lake Township, Becker, uh, Santiago, Baldwin, Oroch, and Palmer Township. All locations will receive wireline service. The minimum speeds offered will be uh, 1,000 over 500, but again, uh, capable of five gigabits symmetrical. Certainly this um, complements Midcoast kind of ongoing network expansion and our investment in the county. Um, we, uh, you know, as, as you can see, we, we invested heavily in this auction in Sherburne County because we are committed to growing here and, and growing with the county as the county progresses. Um, construction for RDOF areas will begin in 2022 and continue into 2023. Uh, so here is a map of Sherburne County. So um, a little hard to see, but the orange lines are Midco fiber. The light blue is existing coverage. So that is what we um, completed in 2020. The dark blue is our fiber to the home coverage in 2021. And the uh, kind of shaded dark blue are all of the RDOF areas that we won um, in Sherburne County that we'll, we will start construction in 2022 and continue in 2023. Does anybody have any questions on this map or anything with the, the federal action? Uh, well, Madam Chair, yes, now, where, where the orange lines are the are your midco fiber. Yep. Did, did it looks like they run along areas where there may be other fiber that was put in by I'm going to say it Frontier. Uh, okay. Do you have a relationship with them where you're using their fiber or you put your own fiber in? No, Midco, um, we, we use our own infrastructure. That's the only way that we can absolutely guarantee our products. And, um, you know, we really, we do partner with um, other providers, with co-ops, you know, on occasion when it's needed, yeah. um, especially if it's, you know, really rural and it's a really long haul fiber route, many, many miles. But we... Um, and that just kind of goes back to, you know, we're the only wholly owned, operated, and engineered network in the region. So we really use um, as much as we can our own fiber. Are you in some of our conduit now? Um, Dan might know that. Uh, not Yeah, not yet. Okay. We will be. Because <laughs> we have conduit that we have put in that runs along some of these routes that I'm seeing are orange. That conduit remains empty at this point? Or Arvig's in it as well. Arvig. Okay. Okay. So we're still just developing a relationship with Okay, good. We're working on that. <laughs> right. Keep working. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, so again, um, you know, like I said, Midco um, really invested heavily uh, through the RDOF auction in Sherburne County. This, you know, like I said, just complements our ongoing expansion. Um, and over the next several years, this is an area that will be extremely busy for us. 
you know, I know there are some gaps as well in between those RDOF areas and existing coverage or future coverage, and certainly we um, will constantly be evaluating all of these areas to bridge those gaps. Um, Madam Chair. Yes. Quick question. The RDOF action, does that need to be built by 2023 or 2024? Actually, the RDOF action is a six-year build-out. Six. We do have a pretty aggressive schedule for our RDOF build, though, and we do plan on having um, most of these areas completed well before our um, required deadline. Okay. Yeah, I saw your construction schedule in there, and it seemed to me that you had longer, so yeah. Yep, yep. Okay. And Melissa, will you, um, on the RDOF auction, will all those um, areas be served then by um, fiber or will some be wireless? Nope, that will all be fiber, all fiber be fi directly to the home. Okay. Yep. The last thing I just wanted to mention is, you know, a large, a large part of my position is working with, you know, the communities that we serve to ensure that we're expanding our footprint and our service where it's actually needed. And, you know, we do strive to be a force for good and a good community partner. Um, with the communities that we serve, and that takes on many for for forms. So you can see here we do have a foundation, um, and you know we do sponsorships, um, and then work directly with the communities we serve on broadband expansion opportunities, much like the um, conduit lease agreement that we're working on with you guys now. Um, you know, I've, I've found that working directly with the communities that we serve, you know, um, creates trust and it sparks collaboration. So I would just encourage you all to, um, you know, continue to, to reach out uh, if there's anything that we can do, um, you know, expansion opportunities that we can partner on. Uh, Dan has been really great working with a lot of our construction team. So um, reach out to me or our construction team or our general managers um, in the area and we'd be happy to, uh, happy to help out in any way that we can. Well, perfect. Yeah. Any other questions for Melissa? Sure. Hi, Melissa. We spoke on the phone yep. a while ago. Yeah, so yeah. good to see you. And just thanks for all your work up in the Baldwin Township area, Livonia. That whole area is kind of my neck of the woods. Yeah, so yeah, sure. People um, are thrilled. Great. Uh, yeah, I hear very positive things about um, connectivity and um, just access. So excellent. It was perfect timing with COVID for mm -hmm. many households up there. So just appreciate the work and the partnership. Um, I'm curious, and we probably don't even know yet, but with the current relief package that was just passed out in DC, if yeah. that's going to enhance our efforts in any way. So I don't know if you even know that yet, but I do. And I actually brought some information because. I, um, you're exactly right, and I thought uh, this, this um, I've already gotten a couple questions from other communities, so mm -hmm. um, I'm, I know you guys are all aware kind of of the CARES funding um, from last summer that communities got and that could be used for broadband, um, and, but we had really just a short amount of time, like three months to use it, so that was really tough um, on providers to try and deploy. Uh, before that December 31st deadline, but you are correct. So the American Rescue Plan, and I have to look at my notes because it did just pass last week, so, um, so we're still kind of um, digesting all of the information, but um, for communities, this did provide $350 billion for state and local governments. Um, about $120 billion is set aside specifically for local governments, and Minnesota is set to receive $4.8 billion. Um, I'm not sure how, if it's similar to CARES, it will go to the state first, and then um, the legislature and the governor will have to decide how that is split up. I imagine it'll be something similar where the communities apply for, um, I believe that's how CARES worked, that you worked directly with either revenue or MMB to receive that funding. Um, and, and unlike CARES, this is ex this explicitly says it can be used for broadband broadband infrastructure among other things, you know of course like cares in responding to the, to the COVID pandemic. Um, the other big change of this is the time that you have to use this funding is much longer. It's about two years. So we will yes I I imagine we'll <laughs> we'll have those conversations again about um, you know using some of those federal funds for broadband infrastructure. That's so, right. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for Melissa? Thank you very much for that update. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank very you. Much. Looking forward to a great working partnership. We are as well. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right.
Moving on, we'll be receiving our update on and consider the resolution regarding the Mississippi River St. Cloud Watershed, One Water, One Plan. Francine and Dan. Oh, Dan's the lead off. Good morning, Dan. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. We have two resolutions in front of you today for consideration. Uh, we've been Moving quite quickly uh, on these two, uh, we had some great conversations in the month of February with our watershed partners about one watershed, one plan uh, for the remaining portion of our county and then those watersheds. Um, so the two resolutions that we have before you today, uh, the first one is a bit of a formality, essentially establishing the planning boundary uh, that the local partners prefer to use. Uh, you may recall in the past, um, Bowser had a, a, a map of recommended um, watersheds that we work on for planning, and there was always a, a dotted line separating the Mississippi River Sartell and then the St. Cloud watersheds. And uh, you can see that uh, that map is in reference on Exhibit A of the first resolution. Um, so the, the, the dashed line, the dotted line, es essentially uh, you know, formed a boundary but allowed us for some flexibility uh, seeing that numerous watershed-based programs uh, in collaboration with the Pollution Control Agency had been operated on in the past using separate boundaries for the St. Cloud and the Sartell watersheds. Uh, so uh, we, we had discussions at the staff level uh, bringing uh, staff opinions and then our discussions with our respective boards uh, forward to, to all the partners and myself and then also Zach Tormson and uh, Lynn Witashik uh, and Francine participated in those meetings representing the uh, Sherburne County and Soil and Water. Um, like I said, uh, the, the discussions were such that the consensus was that operating on uh, those two boundaries, the St. Cloud and the Sartell separately, seemed to be the preferred uh, route to go. It's a, uh, a good size of uh, uh, area to work within and a good number of partners to share the workload with. Um, so that is the first resolution that you have in front of you. And I'll explain the second resolution and then I'll entertain any questions if you don't mind. Uh, the second resolution then is um, this asking this board to support our application for a One Watershed, One Plan uh, grant application for this year. So. The St. Cloud Group, which again, you can see the exhibits, uh, the maps in, in as far as uh, what partners would be included on that. Um, the second part of our, of our discussion was now that we have the planning boundaries set, what are everyone's thoughts as far as when we apply for this funding uh, to, to take on this process? And everybody was ready to go. And when I say everybody, I mean all the partners involved. So the, uh, the consensus again was that we apply this year. We have a bit of a short time frame. Uh, so the RFP should come out sometime this spring, and we anticipate about a June deadline. It's, it's, it's doable, but it's a short time frame. And there's been, uh, this, this cycle will be competitive. There's some other watershed groups that will be, um, let, let me put it this way, there are more watershed groups applying for funding than there is funding to go around. Uh, so it will be competitive to receive that grant this year. But uh, everybody's on board, and so we see this as an opportunity to, to get this uh, process started, which we've been aiming to do so for s some time. So that then is the second resolution, uh, which is just a, a motion of support to uh, apply for this, uh, this planning project. All right. Any questions for Dan? Madam Chair, uh, just uh, we see that uh, Sherburne County lies entirely within the St. Cloud watershed and we're joining in what's the reasoning behind that yeah so we're about 89 percent of sherburne county is within the saint cloud watershed so the uh, essentially if you think of most of the area east of highway 169 that is within the rum river watershed so we have that process ongoing um, should be completed this fall sometime and so this would be an application for that other watershed that covers the majority of our county to start a one watershed, one plan for that, uh, for that portion of our county and that watershed. So we aren't going to be part of the Mississippi River Sartell watershed plan? Or? We would not be a partner in that plan, correct. Okay, so we're partnering with the St. Cloud watershed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions? So I just... A quick question. Mr. Dolan. So that's a 
Sartell's watershed, that's a different watershed completely that uh, I'm, I'm, there's a little bit of disconnect calling it one watershed, one plan, and we were all one and now we're splitting it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and it's, you can think of watersheds on multiple scales. So, you know, Lake Fremont has its own watershed. Eagle Lake has its own fr watershed. Lake Orono has its own watershed, but Lake Orono also includes the bulk of the Elk River and the Briggs chain, which feeds into it. So, you know, there's watersheds at multiple scales. So when we say one watershed, one plan, I understand where you're coming from. The, you know, the goal is to select a planning area that has, uh, again, a, similar resources within it. Um, you know, if we were, if we were to, in a, a proper scope of work, per se, for the boundary. So if we were to uh, do a planning effort on the Mississippi River watershed, that includes multiple states, who knows how many different, uh, you know, LGUs and, and all that. So, um, so the scale of work um, is w one thing we had to consider. And then the number of partners involved in the project. Um, with, with the RUM, we have 18 uh, parties involved in that. And so uh, you can imagine the challenges of, of getting that group involved in a Zoom meeting. Um, but but uh, so, so selecting the scale of work to work on a watershed basis was our main emphasis of you know, put, of, of splitting those two watersheds apart. All right, so essentially the, the one watershed was too big and not quite manageable, so we went down one more macro. Yep, yep, we went to a different level essentially. And, and you know, the, the folks in Morrison, um, they, they preferred to work on a smaller boundary as well. And we have a precedent with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency for some watershed work that they are uh, in charge of from, as a state agency working on those separate St. Cloud and Sartell borders. So we wanted to be consistent with that previous work. Yeah, and, and my concern is I, I just don't want to deviate from what the entire point of this whole thing was. We went from county level soil and water conservation to one watershed, one plan, and now we're saying, ah, maybe not quite one watershed, one plan, maybe two watersheds, one plan. Sure. Two watersheds, two plan. And, and I mean, I trust you guys to, to know what's manageable. It just, I want to make sure that it doesn't, hurt us in the future as we pursue one watershed, one plan grants and other other things that's making this split is gonna hurt us. Absolutely, yeah, I appreciate your concern. And, um, you know, so so we are we are planning on different water bodies then within the St. Cloud and Sartell, so you, your, your level of attention, um, again, you wanna find somewhere right in the middle, right? You, you can't be spread too <laughs> thin, uh, but you don't wanna be too focused uh, with a planning effort, so this is kind of an in-the-middle option. And then the funding that we'll ultimately get uh, for One Watershed, One Plan, which will, will be funding to approve the high-priority items within the plan. So that's not based on a, like a land scale basis. It's, it's based upon a formula using uh, the number of shoreland miles, uh, river miles, and then also private, um, private acre, privately owned acres. Mm -hmm. So it, it will be uh, scalable down to the appropriate um, the watershed size that we're working on. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So Dan, to my understanding, what you're saying is that we are creating watershed areas that we have partners to work with that are all along that same watershed area, and we're all going to work together to do the same um, thing in planning and what is the best um, to keep that watershed area um, in healthy shape and stuff. So you're working together. That's what you're basically doing. Absolutely, absolutely. And when working on a watershed uh, scale, it's much different than just drawing the line at the county scale. You know, previously with our county water plans, which is the way that we were doing things, uh, we our, our plan started right as the, the water in the Elk River hit the Sherburn County line. Um, and we, of course, know that that's, that's not the case. We, you know, we're, if we're going to manage the Elk River, we need to manage it holistically. Um, and similar for other water bodies that cross county lines. So we'll be working with our partners within the watershed and, and um, going at things from a watershed concept, so. So you all be doing the same things along the way, which will help. And then you made it smaller just for management purposes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and, and the plan will need to be customized to address resource concerns in, you know, we have we have some urban areas such as the city of St. Cloud that we share with our watershed partners, uh, the city of Elk River, city of Big Lake. Uh, we have forests, we have prairies, we have agricultural areas in all of these counties. So, uh, so there will be different 
uh, applications or different um, strategies applied to the, the different natural resource concerns. Okay. Commissioner Colby? So thanks, Madam Chair and Dan, for all your work on this. Obviously, being pretty intimately involved with the Rum River One Watershed One Plan um, and the number of entities that are involved in this, this really makes sense. Trust me on that. And if you look at the map that Bowser provided, a number of these larger watersheds, they have suggested some different configurations, and there was a lot of thought put into why those dotted lines are in certain areas. And if you want to know that, Bowser will spend a lot of time <laughs> explaining that, and they would come to a meeting, I'm sure. So, but I believe that just to be more the most successful we can be with this big watershed that we're going to tackle next, this really makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I also am so grateful that we have the backdrop and all the lessons that we've learned through the Rum River One Watershed One Plan, which our staff has worked so hard at, county and uh, soil and water office and many other people, our attorneys, county attorney's office, so many hours on helping us get to where we are with that. So this is so exciting because this has, we've worked so hard to get to this point. So I'm very excited for today and the decision that all the men entities made to to do this split. I'm excited as well. <laughs> Thank <Good>. you. <laughs> so I Sneezy has a question. Well, I mean, it, it's pretty clear that the water that starts out in the Sartell watershed ends up in this watershed, right? The, the Sartell drains primarily to the, uh, the Mississippi River, so like portions of Morrison County either drain into the Mississippi River or into Little Rock Lake which discharges into the Mississippi River. Right. Um, and then of course the Mississippi River flows along you know, our southern border. So, so we will, it, it, it's difficult again with a, a river the size of the Mississippi, we all contribute towards the Mississippi and we'll need to manage our resources within the Mississippi as well. Well, my thought is that you know if we improve water up there, it improves water down here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I mean, it should, should not necessarily be a competitive spirit between the watersheds, the improvements made uh, in either of them just flow out sure. of them, so. Yeah, and we will all, all the watersheds, all 80 so that are on that map will have their opportunity to complete this process. The, uh, the funding that we get to pay staff to carry the workload, to hire a consultant to do the analyses and write the plan, that funding is limited from year to year, so that's the only competitive nature that we'll face this year. But we, if we get it this year, great. If we don't, we will get it uh, eventually. Bowser would like to see these completed for all watersheds. So, but we'll do our best. Perfect, thank you. Any other questions for Dan? All right, hearing none, um, do these motions have to be separate of each other? Chair Daniel Oski, <clears throat> members of the commission, you can make one motion and pass both, uh, or you can separate them if it's important. Uh, the minutes will reflect that they're both passed, however. Okay, then at this point, I'd be looking for the motion to approve the attached resolution of forming the following two actions. One, splitting the planning boundary into two separate planning boundaries, named the Mississippi River Sartell and the Mississippi River St. Cloud, for future one watershed, one plan related programs, and two, supporting a one watershed, one plan grant application for the Mississippi River St. Cloud watershed. I'll make that motion. Motion made by Commissioner Foby and seconded by Commissioner Brandt. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Just for clarification, uh, Chair Danielowski, uh, the motion you said is for resolution. It is two resolutions. Uh, by board of consensus, we can interpret what your action was is to approve the two resolutions. Correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you. We approve the attached resolutions affirming the following two actions. Yeah, thank yep. you. Okay. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, I want to um, thank Commissioner Foby and everybody else that was involved. This is a long, very complicated process, <laughs> obviously, with a lot of players involved. So thank you for all your hard work. All right, moving on then to the next item of business is to consider a conditional use permit application for a personal storage structure. And we have Mark. Good morning, Mr. Schneider. 
Good morning, Ms. Madam Commissioner, Madam Chair. Um, commissioners, the, these are the recommendations from the February 18th Sherman County Planning Advisory Commission. Um, the first item on your agenda uh, from the Planning Advisory Commission is uh, Stephen and Sidney Mackinoff requesting a conditional use permit for a personal storage structure in section 15 of Orac Township. Uh, this is in the general rural uh, zoning district and within the shoreland overlay district of Ann Lake. Planning Commission recommended approval of this uh, conditional use permit with the nine conditions listed uh, and the findings of facts that were provided to your, in your packet. All right. Any questions for Mark? No? Madam Chair, I'll, I'll move approval with the conditions outlined and findings of fact as presented. Motion made by Commissioner Dolan. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Foby. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Now moving on to consider the approval of the preliminary and final simple plat for Cranberry Hill Farms second edition. Yep. Mark. This is a replat. Uh, they're altering lot lines, so they're not creating new lots. This is in section 12 of Livonia Township. Uh, Planning Commission gave a recommendation of approval of both the preliminary and final plat uh, with the five conditions listed. Right. Chair Danielowski, I'll move approval. Motion made by Commissioner Foby. Seconded by Commissioner Grant. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Moving on to consider the conditional use permit application for personal storage structure. Mark, this is your show. Yep, got yeah, quite a few. And <laughs> uh, so this is Scott Lillistrand. Uh, also requesting a conditional use permit for a personal storage building. Uh, this is in section 15 of Big Lake Township, it's on a 20-acre parcel in the General Rural Zoning District. The Planning Commission recommended approval with the four conditions listed in your packet uh, based off the findings of fact made at the meeting. All right, any questions for Mark? If not, I'd be looking for a motion. Move approval, Madam Chair, with the conditions and... As presented? Okay. Motion made by Commissioner Schmeezing. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Dolan. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Next item of business, consider interim use permit application for business selling vehicles, boats, farm equipment, and auto repair slash mechanical or body. L all T trucks and tractors, LLC. Mark? Yeah, great. Uh, this one is in section 24 of Big Lake Township in the subdivision of Spanky's Corner. Uh, this is in the commercial district and it is within the Shoreland District of Bueller Ponds. Uh, this is a kind of expansion of our commercial and economic opportunities in our, one of our townships. Uh, Planning Commission recommended approval of this interim use permit with the 14 uh, conditions and findings of fact listed. All right, any questions for Mark? Madam Chair, just one quick question. I think there's been a number of IUPs in this facility, hasn't there? Didn't yeah. we have a tiny house deal? In the there's summer? been. Do, so, do we clean those up as we go along? Yes, we have been. Okay. Um, and we have a new owner. Um, so this yeah. is the old bus garage in Big Lake uh, yeah. Township, yeah. Uh, right outside the city limits of, uh, right outside the city limits. And they've had numerous operations. And one of the conditions of approval of this subdivision um, was all uses in the subdivision had to have an IEP okay. because it's a commercial district within a shoreland district. So there were additional things. Uh, we have a good owner. Uh, this is a neat small business operator that kind of specializes in a kind of a unique business. Okay. Um, good operator. So yes, we are going through and cleaning this up. So my hope is you'll see more things occurring in Spanky's Corner because that shows progress. So I'll, I'll move approval as condition. Okay, motion made by Commissioner Schmeezing. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Foby. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. And that motion carries. Moving on then to consider the approval of preliminary and final simple plat of Dean Anderson third edition MC development of Elk River. Madam Chair, I need to recuse myself from items number 
eight and nine for conflict of interest. All right, thank you, Commissioner Dolan. All right, Mark. Great. Um, this is a one lot subdivision of an existing out lot. So they're looking to create a buildable lot on this eight acre uh, parcel land in section 27 of Livonia Township. It does about Highway 169. Uh, Planning Commission did recommend approval of this um, simple and final plat, uh, which is in connection to the next agenda item, but it is independent of, it, of that request. So the purpose is separate action. All right. Any questions for Mark? Madam Chair, just if, if that lot went up, looks like a flag lot. Mm -hmm. But the flag doesn't go to the road. The, it has a lot of road frontage. Is that it's just the way the land worked out, apparently, huh? It, it does. And there was an existing lot adjacent to it that impacted kind of the shape and layout of the lot. Okay. Um, you'll see one of the conditions uh, of approval was to ensure that uh, the lot from uh, Dean Anderson's second edition uh, would be granted a 50-foot easement um, to ensure that they had access to 119. Okay. Um, it's kind of a unique situation out yep. there. Um, but the developer was very accommodating and working with uh, the county and the township on this matter. A motion approval. Motion made by Commissioner Sneezing. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Foby. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. And we would have one abstention. All right, that motion passes. Moving on to the second consideration for this IUP is to consider the interim use application for business selling vehicles. No, wait, sorry, I'm, I'm up one. Consider interim use IUP application for highway planned unit development for mini storage. Mark. Great. So this is on that same property that we just discussed that got preliminary and final plat approval. Um, this is an eight acre lot that was left as an out lot for a number of years. It was a uh, property that was always slated for some commercial or industrial use. So going back to 2007, um, it's been sitting vacant. The county has received, you know, a significant amount of calls on this. Um, the developers moved forward with uh, this request. Uh, the Planning Commission recommended approval with uh, 15 conditions uh, in the findings of fact. Staff is recommending a 16th condition um, that establishes uh, termination upon sale of the interim use permit. That's a common condition added to well, this requirement of our ordinance, and it was an omission on my end, uh, just at that part, so that has been added. Um, in addition, the county attorney in reviewing the IUP application um, has determined that a developer's agreement is not required, provided we strengthen uh, condition number uh, three. So uh, county, based off of county, uh, Assistant County Attorney's recommendation, Tim Syme. Um, we're looking for the board to strike condition number one and amend condition number three to strengthen it so we do not need that developer's agreement. So striking condition one. Yep. And doing what to number three? Yes, number three. All right. And I do want to make sure that I convey this. Uh, at the Planning Commission, um, we presented this with an hours of operation um, from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, Planning Commission made a recommendation to modify that to uh, 7 a.m. to confirm that's right. Uh, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, the developer has objected to this condition, has provided a letter that was included in the board's packet um, expressing concerns that the additional uh, constraint on hours of operation will impede the business operation, giving people access to the property before, or, you know, on their way to work and following their way to work. So uh, I'd just like to say the developer has been very accommodating through this entire process, working with uh, Livonia Township and the county. This is a planned unit development. We're not rezoning this property. We're establishing an interim use permit for planned unit development. And our ordinance specifies we can place additional performance standards for screening for operation of the business. And that is what staff has tried to do, uh, you know, accommodate those requests of the planning, planning commission in the Livonia Town Board. And the applicant's done a very good response. 
uh, responding to those issues. Uh, but they did have that objection that I wanted to make sure the board was aware. Um, yeah, being a uh, storage unit owner ourselves in business, that's really hampering that business's ability to be successful by limiting those hours to that extent. That's a real tough one. People like to have access. That's the first question they'll ask. Can I get access? And most times to be successful, your answer is 24 seven. So I would struggle with that one as well. I mean, you put a lot of money into these things and I would like to us to trust the owners to be doing the right thing. Normally they're lighted, normally they're camera surveil. I guess I just don't understand what the issue is along a highway as to why there would be a concern of that kind of limitation of hours on this business. And I can respond. Uh, the Planning Commission um, was responding to re a residential use adjacent. So there's four or five homes adjacent to this um, development. And that was, I think, what the Planning Commission was responding to. We did receive one comment, not from an immediate neighbor, but a neighbor a little bit further down the road, so not an adjacent neighbor, about uh, concerns about increased traffic flow in the area and potentially crime associated with uh, a commercial business in that location. Okay. Any other questions? Well, this is an IUP, correct? Yes, it is. So there is the opportunity to, if there are problems, to address them. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that is, in part, you know, when reviewing this with uh, Tim Syme, the, the Quest to make sure we have enforceable conditions is something that, you know, one of the things that we really strive to do. Because if I go through this and I have an issue with hours of operation or any other conditions on IEP, that that condition is clearly established and I can, you know, pursue enforcement if they do violate those conditions. Uh, and then the county attorney's office, if needed, uh, could support us in any kind of uh, legal action. So staff's recommendation is? Staff's recommendation, uh, we recommend approval of this IEP. And the developer's been a very good developer. Um, as far as hours of operation, um, staff put in there what the applicant had originally requested. So when we presented this to Planning Commission, we went along with what the applicant had provided. We didn't modify those recommended hours of operation that was done at, by the Planning Advisory Commission. So we could go back to the original um hours of operation that they proposed, and that was 6 o'clock to um, 10 o'clock? Yes, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. That at least gives people the opportunity to have a little more access. What are the wishes of the board? So if I may just mm -hmm. ask a few, another question, Chair. Um, you stated in your early comments that you had significant calls on this property. So what were those types of calls, like generally? Uh, inquiries. I get a lot of the business calls. Uh, in Sherburne County, we get a lot of phone calls um, for um, contractor sheds mm -hmm. and storage. Mm -hmm. I'm amazed by the appetite of storage in our mm -hmm. area and throughout as I drive up and down Highway 10, uh, the demand for storage. Um, so majority of the requests that I had gotten on this property were for either a contractor shard mm -hmm. under some type, and that is a use that is allowed as an interim use permit in the general rural district, or a contractor shard, which is only possible through the highway PUD, which gave us the opportunity to establish higher performance standards. Um, one of the things I thought worked really well with this application um, was the feedback that the township provided regarding screening operations. A recommendation was to do a vegetated berm. Because this is, you know, abutting 169, we want to make sure this is a visually appealing project. Because this is in a rezone, because it's a PUD, we were allowed, I mean, we were able to establish higher performance standards for the business. And the applicant has, you know, you know voluntarily complied with those things and wanted to address those issues on a, on a number of different factors. It's clearly where this property is located, it's clearly geared towards certain uses and are pretty limited. I mean, it's no access to septic water. You know, it's like smack dab almost between Elk River and Zimmerman in, you know, off 169, which I drive by many times every day. So um, limited uses as far as that property, and this seems to be a, a good use for that. I, too, 
um, just having used storage units in my lifetime over many moves cross country, um, people tend to want to use those after their work hours and things. So I think um, it's hard to get to those during the general working day for most people. So I have similar thoughts about the hours. I don't want to limit the company and set it up to not be successful mm -hmm. because I'm very impressed with the, the proposal, what's going in there, so. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Um, with uh, Chair Danielowski, with the board's permission, I can kind of craft a, a motion to include the conversation you just had. I could try to recite it to you now so you have an idea, even though there's not a motion on the table. So we can hear what it would sound like? Sure. Okay. Uh, so if there's a motion to approve, it, I think it'd be clear to say motion to approve the uh, interim use permit uh, with the remaining renumbered 15 conditions as modified by the following. Modify or strike existing condition one. Modify as per the county attorney existing condition three. Modify as per the county board existing condition number 10 to include hours of operation of 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Does someone want to make a motion then to reflect? I'll make that motion. Okay, motion made by Commissioner Sneezing. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Foby. So motion as recited by Bruce. That is what's on the table. Yes. Is that including expiring when ownership changes? It does. All right. Okay. Any other questions? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you. It's too bad that storage units get kind of that bad connotation. No, most of the time, they're very, very good run facilities. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Moving on then to our next item. Um, item number 10, consider the amending zoning and subdivision ordinances, ordinance 252 to update procedures and clarify language in the subdivision ordinance and make consistent the definitions of buildable area within the zoning and subdivision ordinances. Mark. Thank you. And this is actually the reason why I asked uh, Nancy Riddle if I could present uh, to the county board today. Uh, this has been a pretty lengthy effort to update the Sherburne County Subdivision Ordinance. And a lot of moving parts uh, with this ordinance. I thank staff for their patience with me in crafting this, you know, revising this ordinance and the work that I did with Tim. Um, but today I'm presenting to the County Board the Planning Commission recommended of approval of the Ordinance Amendment 252 to update the procedures, uh, clarify language in the Subdivision Ordinance, making consistent definitions um, throughout the ordinance in the buildable areas within the Sherburne County Subdivision Ordinance. Making these detailed changes are listed in your packet. So this was essentially a, a rewrite of the County Subdivision Ordinance. Without changing the intent of the ordinance, it was to ensure that our language was consistent and easily uh, accessed and used by developers in Sherburne County, whether it be a private homeowner, or a land developer. They had clear understanding of what was being done. So it was a significant amendment that we had prepared uh, for the Planning Commission. And the Planning Commission had given us recommendation of approval of this. Um, but we had one item that we wanted to explore further that held this up. And that had to do with the uh, definition of a buildable lot area. And so the staff took it up, you know, upon herself and looked at this and found out, okay, if we're going to modify language about what is buildable in Sherburne County. And currently our standard is you have to have 40,000 square feet at least with at least three feet of separation between the highest known water table. Um, if we were going to do that, it required amendments to both the zoning and subdivision ordinance. Again, to make these languages consistent in both documents. So we brought this back to Planning Commission and presented this amendment um, with a revised definition for buildable area. And reviewing that ordinance, the Planning Commission gave us a recommendation of approval. Um, following that hearing, uh, we did receive a, you know, a letter 
that was included in the board's packet from uh, the county surveyor, yeah, our local county surveyor, private surveyor, uh, expressing concern that the definition maybe went a little too far and asked us just to evaluate it. So staff did take a considerable amount of effort. So in between planning commission and this meeting today, staff was evaluating um, the revised definition for a buildable lot area. And the reason we were tackling this definition in part was to ensure that areas that really couldn't be developed or built on um, were being excluded from being counted. And the example I would just give really quickly is you could have a, a five acre parcel, uh, and we do have these examples, a five acre parcel of land that um, essentially has 18,000 square feet of buildable area when you take out the applicable setbacks and easements. So a person's buying a lot, they think they're getting a five acre lot. Well, it's actually only 18,000 square feet of buildable area. We create, that creates a lot of conflicts. Um, some of those conflicts manifest into a variance application. Um, and these were just factors of an ordinance that didn't drill down into the definition enough. Um, so staff reviewed this, uh, reviewed the concerns of um, uh, the surveyor from Bogart Peterson, uh, Craig, and modified the definition, which has been handed out to the county board today. And we found that the definition, his concern was really focusing on road setbacks. Being able to count that area in the buildable area, it sounds a little counterintuitive, but septic systems can go into that right away. Okay, by establishing this, or, by establishing this definition and the rewrite of our ordinance, um, we are making, we've kept the 40,000 square foot requirement still there, but you add in those additional setbacks, you get to about uh, 16,000, 14 to 16,000 additional square feet because of uh, prohibited easements where they can't count as developable any longer. But if we added in that 10,000 square feet of land in between the road and the house, the, the road setback area, uh, it would total about 25,000 additional square feet that this definition would be taking away. And we found that that additional land on the roadside didn't really address the issues that we started out trying to solve, which were large setbacks to natural environment and lakes that they weren't being able to count before, or private easements for utility or gas lines that the developers could count before. Those were the ones that were really causing us issues. It wasn't as much the road setback in the definition. So I've, you know, Nancy handed out the proposed revisions, and you'll see a couple things in red in the definition. Um, Tim Syme has reviewed this, uh, and he actually gave me a couple edits all about, what, two minutes before the meeting, Tim? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, sorry. So that is what you're seeing today. Uh, so this is a comprehensive rewrite of the county's zoning, or subdivision ordinance, with amendments to the zoning ordinance to establish a uh, a buildable lot area for Sherburne County that didn't exist before. All right, any questions? Oh, Madam Chair. No. Commissioner Spinsey. I appreciate your efforts on this. As I went through this, I read the letter from uh, Bogart Peterson, and I actually talked to uh, Nancy this morning on it, and appreciate your willingness to reconsider it and take a look at it, and I think the outcome is a good one. I think you, well, I would guess that you've satisfied his concerns, and that's appreciated, so. I have no problem with this. Okay. Any other questions? If I could just respond to one thing. So he did have some other items uh, in there uh, that were things that require a little bit more depth. He really only had a, it was refreshing to get you know a comment from a, one of our local sur surveyors that does a lot of work in our area. They had very minimal objections or concerns about the ordinance. So it's kind of like, okay, we're not too far off. Um, but there were a couple items that we're not going to address. We may bring it back to planning commission for further discussion because we didn't think it was appropriate to make uh, those changes in between um, a plan, you know, the planning commission seeing this information mm -hmm. and the county board acting on it. Yeah, and I was just curious, the public hearing that was held, how um, and then closed, um, what is the procedure that after a public hearing has been held and closed that you do take extra comment after the fact? You know, the past practice uh, that has been um, 
if we receive comments. We've had a couple, I've been referring with a couple different contentious items. Uh, it's that idea of um, ensuring that the public is fully getting their opportunity to comment. I realize it's a public hearing, um, but we did have some challenges through COVID that caused us to have to be a little bit more considerate of um, comments that were received. So following past practice, um, I provided this additional feedback from the okay. county, from the, from the outside the I just want to make sure we're following consistency and procedures. So yes, Commissioner Fair. Colby. Um, and weren't these uh, the comments from Bogart similar to one of the Planning Commission members' uh, comments? Baldwin Township, um, recommend, they didn't support this. In the, at the Planning Commission, and I don't know if it was made part of the record or if it was post record, um, one of the comments that Brian Lawrence, uh, representative for Baldwin Township said, he thought this applied to all lots. So existing lots of record. And you know that was a that's a major difference. If we we're talking about existing lots of record, you guys think about all our little lake lots, all the lots that already exist. The standard is not applying to them. It's only applied to properties when they're being newly developed. And I think there was a little bit of concern that it was maybe too far overreaching. But the primary concern from the, the township was that they uh, misinterpreted the ordinance, thinking that it was applying to existing lots, not strictly new lots. Instead of everything is grandfathered in prior to yep. the change. The standard does not apply to them. Right. Okay. So it, it helps you build into the future with hopefully as less problems as possible that arise. We really, the intent of this was really, you know, the, the, the intent of fixing the ordinance was because it, after 20 plus years, it becomes very, things don't line up properly. Um, the attention to detail that Tim Syme gave the ordinance to make sure we had some consistent language is, is a good resource. I appreciate that. Um, the other item connected to buildability was something we just didn't have. And we started seeing negative impacts from that. Mm -hmm. And we have had negative impacts from it. Our Board of Adjustment sees request on lots that were platted out that shouldn't be going in front of the Board of Adjustment. That's what we were trying to address with this amendment. And it all started when we had a plat that had large easements on it that were occupying a lot of land. And uh, the surveyors adjusted a lot of the industry is adjusting. Staff is really trying to caution. This amendment is going to help us yeah. ensure that we have, you know, more suitable lots for development for the residents that are coming here or for the people that are coming out of Sherburne County. Well, usually if you have a lot of variances coming off of something, it shows you that you need to go back to the ordinance because you've got to tighten something up. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. We go through this document. There's... We're concentrating on one small area, but there is tremendous amount of uh, blacked out lines and uh, that sort of thing in here that have changed. And so we are making this wholesale change at this point. Yep. And in the... And a lot of the, the line, the stuff was redundant or in two different places in the ordinance. And I know Nancy's talked about it before and you've probably been involved. I mean, by and large, this is a cleanup of a document. This is really impacts the outcomes. I think that's a good distinction. Um, a lot of the work that we did in updating the ordinance was to ensure we had clear, language, clear and consistent language. Um, over the years, it just had come apart, an amendment. Maybe we didn't use the same verbiage. Um, maybe the language was never completely clear in the first place. And we started implementing a policy, an interpretation of it. So we've eliminated um, the ambiguity of the ordinance and put it in black and white. That's why you'll see so much striking, because it has to be a more complex statement. Well, I just wanted to say, too, it, a lot of times something got moved somewhere else and things were rearranged, so it looks probably like more than what actually got changed. But a lot of it is cleanup, like Mark said. Well, I just, uh, I'm focusing on this. This whole thing with all the lines on it is way more than this little mic can handle. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that has to be understood. So, I, you know, hopefully we don't find we have a lot of technical changes that come back here, and I don't believe we will uh, adjust you on all of that, so. Any further discussion? With that, I'd be looking for a motion. Madam Chair, I'll move it. Motion made by Commissioner Schmeezing. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Foby. Any further discussion? 
Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank wow, you, I think you're sure. done. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Have a good day. Thank you. Um, moving on then to consider the draft park dedication and memorials policy and guidelines. Gina. <laughs> Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good morning. Um, I'm going to flip to the next slide. Or do you have it up, Keisha? So this agenda item uh, came about because over the past six months or so, we've received a couple of requests for placement of memorials in parks. And it became apparent pretty quickly that a policy would be really helpful <laughs> to put some terms and conditions on um, accepting these gestures in an equitable, fair way that also considers park aesthetics and long-term vision for our system. So many park systems have policies of this nature. So we didn't have to actually reinvent the wheel. We could look at a lot of examples. And in doing that, we drafted some language um, for a policy that's augmented with guideline, guidelines to put parameters on things like criteria and process and funding, installation and maintenance, permanence, location, size, and design. And so the, the draft that we've come up with gives us multiple options and price points for memorials um, that really align with the natural character of our parks. Um, and then we also maintain quite a bit of flexibility with that last park amenity option. And that's to accommodate um, potentially larger donations for like a, a park shelter or a play structure. Um, so the language that you've received has been reviewed by the county attorney and Mr. Messelt and our risk management specialist who provided really valuable input. Um, and we're bringing it to you today to introduce it and get your feedback. And we'll take your feedback and continue to refine the draft um, and bring a final back to you in April, hoping that you would consider approving it as a Parks and Recreation Department policy. All right. Any questions for Gina? Mr. Dolan. Yeah, no, I guess my one comment um, within it was maybe um, that we take a look at tightening up uh, hold on, I'm getting to the language. We kind of, on guidelines and conditions, um, item number two, we kind of, it's kind of vague and it kind of puts it on our shoulders to decide whether we think something's appropriate and fits the natural aesthetics or whatever. Um, in my opinion, I feel like the more beneficial way to do this would be for us as a board or as parks employees to literally pick out exactly what can be done. So it's just defined. Um, otherwise, we're gonna get requests and this board could be this board, it could be different makeup and you'll end up getting varied applications over time regardless. So if we actually selected the plaques, selected uh, the items that can be used on the smaller stuff, it might be more beneficial in my eyes. I guess that was my main takeaway from some of this. Thank you, Commissioner Dolan, Madam Chair. Um, and that's the intent um, with the images before you is what we've kind of selected based on the precedents at Graham's, but you're right about how the language doesn't really reflect that. So yeah. we can clean that up. In that way too, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to, I mean, it might still ultimately have to come to us for approval, but as long as it meets the guidelines, it can be a more or less staff-driven 
we want to donate X amount, we want to put this plaque on this bench, and it's not something that necessarily has to come to the board every time, but that's just my two cents. Thank you. All right, so basically the devil is always in the details, and so I can see where Commissioner Dolan is um, speaking to if we approve a certain design and layout, it's already been approved, so anybody that wants to pick, pick that as a memorial or something, you won't have to come back to us. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Okay. Yep. Commissioner Schmeezy. Now, we already have some memorials. We have some more memorials in this building and on these grounds that we have had, I believe. Uh, how would this impact them? How would we? Which one? <laughs> um, you want to go? Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner, or Mr. Mayor, Commissioner, I apologize. Um, it wouldn't affect that at all because this only deals with county parks and trails. So we've not adopted a policy for government grounds. If that's something that you would ask uh, staff to do, we can certainly develop that. Well, I mean, I wonder if that at some point that's going to be appropriate for us to broaden this out and not just for parks. I think, you know, what happens on these grounds too is... Uh, Maybe maybe should be considered. I don't know how it commingles, but uh, uh, and then also, have we reviewed other? I mean, this is going on across the state. There's other parks that we reviewed how they're doing it and how it's working for them. Yeah, it's it's similar. Um, a lot of this language was drafted based on what we read from other parks departments, and they provide options for people to choose from. Um, so that there's consistency throughout, and it's fair. Yeah. Bruce? Uh, Chair Damialski, Commissioner Schmiesing, uh, you're, you are correct. We, when Gina brought this to us, uh, we thought that it will spur a conversation about a similar policy for county facilities other than parks. So we'll be working on a draft and bringing that forward for you sometime in the future. All right, thank you. Any further comments? Yeah. If not, then I would be looking for a motion to approve. Uh, no, no motion, just. Oh, okay. This is board information and consideration. Sorry. Yeah. Um, you get our consensus then? You got the gist? Yep. Right. Yep. We got your feedback, and that's what we were hoping for. So thank you very much. And any, any comments you have afterwards, too, please feel free to send them to Gina between now and when we finalize it. Just one other quick comment on, you know, on the, on the larger ones. I think there should be, you know, if people, if they're going to lay down a large sum of money, I think we should have the opportunity to negotiate with them what they want. You know, people that are involved in that, the more you put in, the more you have the ability to make the call on what you're doing with our approval. I mean, I, so I, I, we, we want to keep that end open, I think, to some degree. On, on that note, one other, th that brings up kind of one other item that I was going to hit on, and that's in uh, item number 11, which talks to the 50% of land value deeded or 50% of capital construction costs. Um, I wouldn't, my, I, I guess I don't know the exact language to use, but I wouldn't necessarily limit it to 50% of deeded land or 50% of cap construction. I mean, there might be a legacy fund that someone leaves that gives a donation over time to fund operations of something that I would think, regardless of what it's going to, that type of dedication to the county would would receive the same same opportunities. I would imagine. And there might be there might be times, you know, we we look at some of our parks where the the, the park land is paid for through grants, but they're willing to drop a few hundred thousand dollars on, on programming within the park or something like that. I'd, I'd like to be, be able to acknowledge that as well within the, within the policy, so. And Good suggestion. Gina, I was wondering, based on um, Commissioner Smeezing's comments about um, if there's gonna be a large sum of money possibly um, that maybe could provide a pavilion or something of that nature. I'm assuming that we would want to have some set designs based on each park's um, kind of like what, how they're designed to be and what the materials are being used in that park. 
Um, so I'm thinking that that would be appropriate or if, and then they would have a plaque. They would be able to have a plaque put on that, um, that it was their dollars or they just put money into the park system and use that will. Because I know you want to keep some consistency of what the park looks like. Yeah, I, I think it would be beneficial to have some language that allows staff to coordinate mm -hmm. the engineering and design of structure, play structures or yeah. park shelters or things like that. Um, so I can work with uh, the county attorney's office and administration on that. Perfect. All right. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Sure. And I also concur with as much as you can uh, put concrete examples so they can pick from this, this, you know, for the structure, it's A, B, or C. The plaque can be A, B, or C. And it wouldn't have to come back to this board. So your department just takes ownership. I support that. Yeah. Thank you. Because you guys know what your design is and your vision is for the parks. Mm -hmm. And we see what that is. So. Yeah. And trust that. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Good feedback. All right. Oh, sorry. Oh, I, just to frame this in a policy, I, I, what I'm hearing the board say, if I get this correctly, is basically we would come up with design guidelines or standards with examples that could be an attachment to the policy and over time if a new park comes online and there's a certain theme to it that could be updated as an attachment and periodically the board can review it but it wouldn't be every bench and everything like that but essentially what you're articulating is is much more defined guidelines and standards uh, with pictures and say benches a b c or d correct right. okay. Yeah. okay and it might make sense to reach out um, to the outfit that did our, our logo and branding for the park system and see what they would recommend for standards as well. So. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I, and I'm sure I agree. With, I think this this is something that needs to be done. <coughs> I completely agree with that. Uh, I think we want to make sure that we do it well this time, and if it takes another month to get it done, let's 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 do it right. Uh, the, Contribution, I'm, I'm looking at item 11B, contribution of greater than 50% of the capital construction costs associated with a park or recreational facility or trail. Uh, and for that, they would get naming rights. Is that, I think we should be a little bit, I think we should review that a little bit too and be a little bit careful with that because that, that they might get a name pretty <laughs> cheap for that. <laughs> <laughs> so at any rate, but let's, I think we should be reviewing that. Okay, part. all right. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Gina. All right. Moving on then to consider the approval of the low bidder for Bridgeview Park improvements. And Andrew. Morning, Madam Chair, uh, County Commissioners. We wanted to bring this one forward as a specific agenda item just so that we can help the County Board understand the, the project and kind of the bidding environment and what we're looking at with this one. So as you can see in your board packet, um, as we started going through refinement of our engineering plans and design, uh, we came up with an engineer's estimate of about $450,000. Um, as we went out to the contracting world for bids, you can see uh, that the bids came in significantly higher than that. Um, this is a world that's a little newer to us. We're used to linear road construction. We did make some adjustments to our, our typical bid prices, but clearly not enough. Um, sometimes the bidding environment does change very really rapidly depending on the season or other uh, factors in the, in the bidding world. What we wanted to do is make sure that the county board understood that even with this award, to the low bidder of JL uh, Thyssen Incorporated, um, we do have those funds available within the park budget to handle that. Um, so although a lot of times we put that engineer's estimate in the board packet for informational purposes to let you guys know kind of where it came in compared to where we thought it was gonna come in, really the number that we look at is what was budgeted for that project through the budgeting process. Um, the other key piece of information that we wanted to make sure that, that you're aware of is that we weren't happy with 
the higher bids either. Short of rejecting all of the bids and going back out again, delaying the project, possibly going through a couple of construction seasons because of some of the limitations we have with, with tree clearing and grading and, and floodplain impacts, um, we've already been in discussions with the apparent low bidder to reduce that cost. We've already trimmed off almost $40,000 of the project. To get that down closer to that $500,000 range that we were that we were really anticipating uh, early on. Half of that, that $250,000 is coming to us from the DNR grant that we received a couple of years ago. And then we would be matching the remaining funds uh, utilizing our, our park county tax levy budget. Um, some of the savings have come by way of modifying some of the rain garden material, doing some of that mixing on site versus hauling in um, a specialized soil formula, if you will. Um, we've adjusted or are considering adjusting some of the signs uh, to reduce some of those costs while still maintaining the look and the features of the park consistent with our, our design. Um, the other one that was very surprising to us is we spec'd out uh, a style of bench. Each one of those benches came in at like $12,000. Yeah. So again, we went back to the drawing board, start taking a look at other options. We can get block limestone, as you kind of saw in the previous item, um, for a much cheaper price that would still work with the, the design and the aesthetics that we've taken a look at through um, our, our public open houses and the design of this project, um, saving us almost $30,000 right there. So we would just wanted to add a little more detail before the county board considered this for approval and remind, and remind you that we take a look at our budget and what we have budgeted and we are within that. Um, but we are still looking at ways to, to trim costs to this project knowing that it came in a little bit higher than we expected. All right, thank you for that input. It always does amaze me the very, the variables that these bids will come in at based on the same spec sheets. I've always found that very interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, and this is one of those examples that there's quite a vast difference. Um, and everything you're talking about <clears throat> doing, I'm assuming the materials you're looking at, like limestone, is still going to be just as durable and um, long lasting as the previous um, product that you were looking at. Correct, Madam Chair, Commissioners, that's one of the things we took a look at as we're looking at these cost savings. We don't want to implement an initial cost saving that's ultimately going to cost us right. more money in the long Perfect. run. We did take a look at the boardwalk. There's a short boardwalk feature to get over some floodplain areas and some wetland areas. Um, but after looking at that, that would cost us more money in the long run, much more money in the long run than it would to spend just a little bit more now to get those features that are more durable and, and less maintenance required with them. All right, yeah, but I think it's a sign of the time. Some of these prices are a little shocker at first, um, but I think that's what, I mean, my husband went to buy some lumber and he just, he came back and said, no, I'll look for scraps. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find scraps. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd imagine with, with uh, the money being granted by the federal government and just the, the general atmosphere around construction and, and contracting this, this is going to be a trend for a little while. I feel like it's not going to be uh, the last time we see uh, um, prices come back a, a little north of where we were thinking we were going to see them. So, yeah. What are we doing here? I guess I'm not familiar with the uh, with the project. Is it is it trails? Uh, yep, Madam Chair, Commissioner Schmeising. So we we've come to the board a couple of times with the project, and it's um, some additional trails. They're going to be gravel style trails, all ADA compliant. Um, if you've ever visited the park before, currently it's got a gravel parking lot um, that's on so a So there's some blacktop involved? Yep, Asphalt. sloped hillside. It's not ADA accessible. We're bringing that parking lot actually down into the park because right now it's kind of on a, a narrow um, entrance to the park right next to two residents. <laughs> bringing it down in there, providing some paid parking, some signing. Um, and then some of the other features include, as I mentioned, the trails heading down to the rivers. There's a couple of overlooks as well up through, uh, down there in the river as well. Okay. And then there's still some natural mode trails that'll still exist. Okay. 
Well, I mean, we're, we're going to be faced with this on our, I think, on our road projects as yeah. well as mm -hmm. we move forward here. We get oil in the mid-60s. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we get people that are going to have all the work they want to do. So right. it's going to be it's going to be some challenges to try to stay within your, you made an engineer's estimate last fall or last summer, you're not going to be accurate. No. Correct. No. All right. Any other discussion or questions? Yes. Um, following board uh, meeting today, we'll send out by a, a simple PDF again a, a, a map or showing the improvements. So we didn't put it in the packet and apologies for that, but we'll make sure you get it. After I'm sure I've seen it, but I just, I don't re recall all of those things. So. Yeah, we don't have to send the full details back, but at least give just some sort of overview. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's the park off of um, County Road 11, right? In Big Lake Correct. Township? Right. Yep. Okay. All right. Any further discussion or questions for Andrew? If not, then I'd be looking for um, a motion to approve the low bidder for Bridgeview Park improvement of JL Peace and Company or Incorporated. I'll move approval. Motion made by Commissioner Foby, seconded by Commissioner Brandt. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, moving on then to receive an update on the current bridge load restrictions. Andrew. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioners, Keisha, I snuck a PDF file into the county board. If I could have you pull that up, that would be great. There we go. Thank you. Um, informational purposes, wanted to bring this forward to the county board just so that they're aware of some of the changes and updates that we've got going on. Um, in regards to the bridges that we own and maintain for Sherburn County. Um, their resource that, that depletes just like our homes do, so we need to maintain those and upgrade those and rebuild those uh, over time. Um, and as we start seeing newer vehicles and newer trucks come on the road, um, MnDOT has taken it upon themselves in the bridge unit to help us by doing some bridge load rating for some of the special hauling vehicles and some of the large vehicles. With that, um, unfortunately, we saw a few bridges come on to the system that are now load restricted. And I just wanted to run through those very quickly. Uh, you'll see a trend in the bridges that are load restricted. Most of the time it is for that special hauling vehicle, which is a essentially a large dump truck with six to seven axles on them. Um, axle weights don't necessarily pertain to bridges because when the whole load is on the bridge, the whole load's on the bridge. Um, so I just wanted to run through those very quickly. Here's kind of a picture of what that special hauling vehicle looks like. So when you see SHV, special hauling vehicle, you can notice there that it's got the, the six axles um, and larger load. Traditional semi-truck, combination truck is what they're called, um, and then a, a double trailer semi-truck. So I just wanted to walk through these very quickly. Um, so with each slide you will see initially a map with the highlight, highlighted location of the bridge and then down in the chart on the left uh, the highlighted bridge as well and what it was in 2019 and what it is now. Um, it, is shown in that 2020 column. Uh, you'll see the single unit trucks or the special hauling vehicles kind of on the left side of that chart, and then your more traditional combination or semi-truck um, in the middle. So the bridge over the Elk River on County Road 15, um, you'll notice that you know multi-pier timber span structure. Uh, we've got one on County Road 4, just west of Zimmerman. The other thing that I should note, out, note as well that I, that I neglected to earlier is in that chart, the items shown in purple are new ones. Those are ones that came about from the most recent rating that MnDOT has completed on those bridges. Again, timber structure, County Road 4, multi-span. I'm just going to roll through these very quickly for purposes of time. Another timber bridge. 
Here's one of our answer notes. is if we just had shorter bridges. <laughs> the I'm just saying. Right. Well, and that's one of the things we take a look at when we redesign these is we take a look and see if we can move them to large culverts. Yeah. That's that's one of the options that we examine. Um, timber bridge. Another timber bridge. These things have a lifespan, obviously. You know, typically you take a look at a timber bridge 35, 40 years. You know, these ones are pushing upwards of 60, 70 years or more. They're all timber structures. So you'll notice over the last few years as we've replaced these bridges, we have gone away from the timber structures knowing that our traffic volumes are going up, knowing that our, our ag equipment is getting larger, um, knowing that our freight traffic through the county is increasing. Uh, we've been moving more towards the concrete structures or again, taking a look and see if we can satisfy it with just culverts. And by doing that then, Andrew, you are able to um, have um, heavier weighted vehicles on when we do move to those concrete structures and? Well, there's always the weight limit on vehicles, which is a completely separate discussion, but we're able to allow up to what those statutory maximums are. Right now we can't because these bridges are all load posted and weight restricted, some of them fairly significantly. So again, you'll notice they're all timber structures. And these weight restrictions are not seasonal. Correct. Yep. You know, so. That's a good point of clarity there is that, you know, we have our spring load restrictions for our roads when the frost is coming out and we've got reduced strength in that road. But these bridge restrictions are full time year round until we get those rebuilt. One of the, uh, if I can go back maybe to the first bridge structure, uh, 71504, which is in Big Lake Township on County Road 15 over the Elk River. Um, we are working on getting design going on that one for replacement, as well as the one on County Road 4, just west of Zimmerman. Um, part of what we're running into is that these are load restricted, but as we go in and we do our sufficiency ratings, they don't meet a level of criteria where they're eligible for state bridge bonding, which is our main mechanism for replacing these rural bridges. You have to be down below a score of 60 out of 100. Um, the only one that meets that threshold right now is that County Road 15 bridge over the Elk River. So then we're, we're left with the discussion of do we leave them load posted? Do we work towards reconstructing them and figuring out some other form of funding for these bridges? Um, or just programming them, you know, traditionally through our, our county improvement program, our five-year CIP. So we wanted to bring these forward just as a point of clarity. Um, I was a little dismayed to see a number of them in and along County Road 16 uh, in the area of County Road 6 um, over in, in Palmer Township and, and Haven Township over there. Um, and the tough part is, is that a lot of times you'll see them sporadically spaced geographically, and there are routes to get around them, uh, that area makes it very difficult to get around those number of, of load restricted bridges. Right. Questions, comments? Well, just a comment. Maybe. If, I mean, the, those, those bridges on County Road 16 were put in in about, when I graduated from high school. <laughs> So that's been like 15 years now. <laughs> no, so those bridges are 50 years old. I mean, that's, and they have served us pretty well. So. Right. And yeah, they don't owe us anything, right? Yeah, we, we appreciate that comment. And, and that being said, you know, obviously our lower bridges, and as we start seeing some of the lower bridge ratings coming and then the sufficiency ratings, it kicks it into a more aggressive inspection program. Um, so these bridges we are inspecting um, every year, taking a look at them, knowing that they are at a point where they're going to start degrading a little quicker than obviously a new bridge would. So, Well, perfect. Any other questions for Andrew? Well, just one other comment, if I may. I, you know, when, when you have these bridges that drives that traffic 
another direction and oftentimes that direction is probably not as well suited to handle it as the road where we have the restricted bridge. I mean, 16 mm -hmm. is a thoroughfare that handles a lot of traffic and if we start pushing that uh, traffic right. up County Road 20 and across three and that sort of thing, we kind of create some issues with doing that too, so. Equal and opposite reactions. All right, thank, thank you, you Andrew for the update. Yes. All right, moving on then to receive the Health and Human Services Director's Report. Amanda. You're not busy at all, are you? I'm here to talk about something other than COVID, so that's nice. Hey. Uh, Keisha's gonna help me hand out the paper copies of the um, 2020 annual report. I know you have a big board meeting, so I'd, I'll just focus my time on the 2020 annual report. Um, so uh, good morning, um, thanks for the time. Um, so if you, uh, Commissioner Schmeezing probably remembers it, but the rest of you might not, HHS used to do kind of a dog and pony show when we presented our annual report and we paraded each one of our supervisors up here and each supervisor talked a little bit about um, their areas, but we're gonna spare you that. I'm gonna try to give you a five minute synopsis and also the report itself is about 32 pages long, so that'll keep you keep you busy at night. Um, <laughs> I'll give you the Cliff's Notes version. So uh, first of all, I want to draw your attention um, to the graphic on the on the page, the cover page. In 2020, before COVID, um, supervisors uh, had a short management team meeting retreat, and one of the items was uh, kind of our branding for integrated services. You hear us talk about it a lot, but really, what does it mean? Who are we as an agency, and what kind of what defines our work? Um, we categorize that into the three P's, um, so our pillars, if you will. Um, one of our pillars is people, so really valuing holistic and comprehensive supports. Uh, we value relationships, we value our clients, we are a person-centered agency, uh, really working, working to find root causes and help people achieve their well-being. Uh, another one of our pillars is Prosper, um, so kind of a redesign of service delivery itself, helping people um, achieve self-sufficiency, uh, stability, uh, decrease um, supports on government systems. Uh, third pillar is partner, knowing that we cannot do this work alone. We know that uh, we have different community resources and really helping bring those resources to the table. Um, community provides most of the supports. Really, it's not government's role to provide those supports. And so when we provide case management services, it's connecting folks um, with, um, with community partners and building systems of coordinated systems delivery. And then lastly, you'll see an arrow. So our three Ps are surrounded by uh, our final pillar, which is equity. Um, knowing that equity isn't a standalone pillar, but really equity is uh, encompassed in all that we do. People do not have uh, equitable access to resources. And so really um, helping to support um, access to opportunity, uh, as well as advancing our commitment for racial equity and systems that benefit all. Um, so, even though we didn't technically um, divide out into our separate divisions until 2021, it was a clean way to um, separate this report. Um, and so uh, you'll notice that the different divisions are, are broken out here. We also uh, placed less emphasis on outcome measurements as we have in years prior, uh, because so many were a big old NA uh, due to COVID, you know, that really changed the way uh, we did business. And also so much of our narrative is around how COVID changed our business. And I know that's not unique to HHS, but that's a common th theme no matter what you're looking toward in 2020. One thing we tried to um, highlight is that COVID actually helped us uh, if, be efficient and highlight some of our efficiencies. Um, in HHS, we really worked lean. Uh, we worked hard on leveraging resources and non-levy dollars to upgrade technology and made improvements. We really uh, tried to innovate our service delivery. One of my favorite um, slogans is scarcity drives innovation because really when you have um, uh, scarce resources or lean resources, it really kind of pushes you to think outside of the box. Uh, we took full advantage of CARES, you all know that, so thank you very much. Um, and then we also maintained our quality compliance uh, with our um, kind of our regulatory uh, bodies and um, achieved excellence in our program service delivery. 
Uh, other areas that are highlighted in each of our division is kind of what we're looking forward to in 2021. We're looking forward to a lot in 2021, um, finding kind of quote unquote our new normal, knowing that it's not going to look like um, February, January in 2020, but what does that new normal look like? Um, continuing to leverage efficiencies with our technology improvements. Um, really watching the legislator legislature closely to see what passes, so what waivers are going to remain in effect, and then um, what waivers don't, where we'll have to go back to our old ways of doing business. And then my personal goal is outreach, 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 um, both uh, with our staff as well as our mobile wellness van, which is taking up about six uh, handicapped parking spots as you walk outside the front door right now. Um, but really uh, using outreach efforts to connect clients with resources. And then, like I said, address the churn. It's a better way of doing business, and it's going to be so much more efficient just for our business uh, back here at the government center. Um, kind of along in that same vein, um, our agency has really embraced uh, a prevention mentality. I know you've heard it before when we've come up to speak to you. Um, prevention uh, is often synonymous with public health, but really looking at prevention in our child welfare system, uh, also around our high system utilizers. That's a very expensive way to uh, operate. Uh, when folks are in crisis. And so really looking at some cross systems partnerships. And we have several going on with HHS, law enforcement, community corrections, county attorneys. Um, at the tail end of your real report, you'll see a special section dedicated to out-of-home placements. We continue to see our out-of-home placements go down because of those prevention efforts. So good news, um, saving taxpayer dollars in that respect. Um, but costs like detox and civil commitments are on the rise and have been for two to three years. So one of my personal 2021 goals is to really, again, look at some innovative strategies, some preventative strategies, so we can start to see those costs decrease and just be um, um, more client-centric. Um, all in all, I think it's, uh, you all know that we have really good people that work here at Sherburne County. Um, we have tremendous support from our county board and our county administrations. We have great relationships both inside the county and outside um, that really help uh, facilitate those partnerships, those innovations. Uh, we have a leadership structure that finally allows us to be able to take a keen look at these innovations, at prevention strategies, at partnerships. Um, and again, I know I'm uh, beating a dead horse a little bit, um, but that leadership structure is also focused on increasing revenue. Um, and again, those preventative strategies are going to decrease county dollars in the long run. So things are looking bright for 2021. Uh, excited to look beyond COVID, probably none so more than myself. Um, and again, I just want to take this opportunity to thank this board, um, this administration for not having a scarcity mentality, um, really looking um, at uh, our work for ways that we can do things better, um, things that we can uh, do more with integrated service delivery, um, while also knowing that we are going to be mindful of our taxpayer dollars, uh, and leverage those non-levy resources. So, with that, I don't know, I know you only had a few minutes to look through, but does anybody have any questions with HHS, how we operated in 2020 or kind of moving forward? I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. And, you know, I was very fortunate to sit through longer presentations by Health and Human Services in years past. So, <laughs> I get that on the table right away. Uh, and, 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 I, and I would suggest that as we uh, get beyond COVID in that that this board has an opportunity for you to bring some of your department leaders in there and to do a little show and tell for us it's because it's impressive and you have to you have to get into the workings of it a little bit to really Absolutely. to really feel it w w what they're doing so I, I think at some point I'd appreciate it I appreciate the comment and we would absolutely like to. And again, I, I know um, you have a, a workshop with our, our sheriff's office later today. Hopefully they'll talk about some of the um, cross department innovations with children with incarcerated parents and some of the things going on with our mental health action team. So thank you, Commissioner. Well, I mean, there are things that go on that are very painful that, that your health and human services staff have to deal with. And I think at some point it'd be good for us as commissioners to know that so we can understand it a little better and support you. Thank you. And what you're doing. So yeah. appreciate that. I agree. Any other questions for Amanda or comments? 
I just want to say thank you, Amanda. This is a very good report, and you and your team, we're for myself, and I'm sure the rest of the board, we appreciate all of your hard work and the uh, wanting to do the best for our, our, our community and everybody involved in their health needs. So thank you very much. Thank you, appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, okay, moving on to our commissioner correspondence and committee reports. Who's ready to go first? Tim, should we start with you? Yeah, I can go first. Um, one second, I'll queue up the, the old calendar. Um, we did have the joint township meeting that we all attended. Um, also, uh, NACO ledge conference virtually. And I believe with me being out of town, that was pretty much the extent of mine over the first week of the month here. Do you have a bunch of little umbrellas for us? <laughs> huh? No? Okay. They got, they got confiscated at customs. Oh, darn. Well, thanks for the try. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Barb. Yeah, um, on um, the third was at the township meeting in the evening, and on the fourth uh, there was... Um, Council on Aging and also CAMI meeting. And um, I listened in on the NACO White House um, meeting on COVID-19. And um, on the next week, because of the NACO conference, I am a voting member of the Human Services and Education Committee, so I was involved with that. And then on the each day afterward, I listened in on one conference um, meeting Tuesday, the environment and en energy land use, and then on the 10th, the health policy, and on the 11th, the immigration one, and um, on Friday, I did public lands, because I just wanted to get a better idea of what all the different groups were working on. And, um, and then yesterday, I didn't have anything, so. <laughs> well deserved. Uh, Breath, right? Lisa. Um, I have testified at a few House hearings and Senate hearings, uh, both on the 169 and 4 overpass and then on the HHS waivers um, supporting the AMC and the MICA platforms. So, yes, and we'll be testifying again tomorrow. I had a futures planning meeting, uh, was at the township quarterly meeting, We're working on the TRICAP executive search, so that's been many meetings with the executive search committee. We're going to be um, placing or naming an interim in the next probably week, or week and a half, and then doing the search process. Um, the NACO ledge conference, I popped in and out of that when I could. Sherburn Soil and Water uh, meeting, also at a TRICAP Executive Committee meeting, and then Central Minnesota Jobs and Training Services Board of Trustees meeting, which I was elected the vice chair last Friday. Congratulations. So. Anything else? That's, that's enough. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> busy. Yes, you have been very busy for sure. In your presence at the Capitol, we appreciate that. Felix. I was at the Township Association meeting. Uh, hopefully next time we have a meeting with them, we give them their meeting back. We kind of co-opted this time, and I, I, I don't think that helped us. That is so. definitely. Uh, and I was at the NACO uh, Economic Development. I did listen in on that for the for the most part. It's been, it's been kind of difficult to keep up with this NACO. I'm sure they're going to brag about registration. But I wonder what attendance is really going to mean at the end of the day for it. So, but at any rate, uh, that's that. Uh, Metropolitan Emergency Services Board uh, attended the MICA meeting. Uh, and that's, uh, I believe, all that I have. MCAT, of course, but that's not part of this. So. <laughs> all right. If 
I can just say a little bit too, working so closely now with MICA and AMC and working on these uh, initiatives at the Capitol, their staff is amazing. I just, you know, I'm talking to them almost every day lately and um, just they are, they work so hard on our behalf, so. With I both think. AMC and oh. MICA are just really strong. Yeah. Very strong, their staff just amazes me, so. And it's kind of hard when you compare them to other um, organizations that we're part of that you just don't see that same level of, um, so we are fortunate, very much so. And I think it's particularly of value when uh, Lisa says that because you've been down there as a senator and you've dealt with a lot of different uh, lobbyists or groups. Well, and I think the key also with Micah and AMC is how well they partner together. They don't, they're not adversary, which I don't know that they've always been that way. Right. So that they're working together and sharing resources and um, coming, their platforms aren't identical obviously, but um, yeah, they're, they're just top notch and yeah. that's really always good to, to hear. Them. So. Always good to hear. Um, my schedule was um, of course March 3rd, the Coralie Township meeting. Um, March 5th, I helped at the vaccination clinic, and that went well. Again, kudos to Amanda and her team. They, it just seems to be seamless. So if there are any issues, it doesn't show. <laughs> and March 8th through the 12th, of course, attended the NACO legislative conference. Did the same thing, popping in and out. I haven't quite decided if I like this. Um, you don't have the ability to, you're just always in listen mode and you don't have the opportunity to interact. Of course, Barb being on one of the committees, she, she could, but yeah, I mean, I like the fact that you could hear a lot of different things and you could like pop in and out of different meetings, but it just was a different vibe, I guess. I don't know for sure if I would like to do that on a regular basis. Um, and then did the, um, had the APO board meeting on the 11th. So that was pretty much the gist of my time. Um, anything else for committee reports or upcoming future agenda items? All right, nothing? Okay. Moving then, we're gonna move on to, um, I'm gonna adjourn the regular meeting at this time and open the community health board meeting. So the first item of business is approving the community health board agenda. I'll move approval. I'll second. Okay. Commissioner Dolan makes the motion and Commissioner Foby seconds. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. All right, going on to the Community Health Board consent agenda. I will be looking for a motion to approve the three items as presented on the consent agenda. I'll move approval. Motion made by Commissioner Foley, and seconded by Commissioner Barant. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Now moving into our Community Health Board regular agenda. Looking for a motion to approve that. I so move. Motion made by Commissioner Brandt. I'll second, Madam Chair. Seconded by Commissioner Schmeezing. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. All right. We're looking to receive the Community Health Services Administrator's bi monthly report. Nicole, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. I know I'm holding you up before lunch, so this will be a oh, we're pretty fine. concise <laughs> update. We're fine. Uh, for uh, CHS administrator updates, we are in the process currently of updating our survey. Um, we did a survey last in 2016 with our partners in Benton, Stearns, and CentraCare, and that should be in the field in April. The survey looks very similar to that um, that was uh, distributed in 2016, but with some updates, some specifically around COVID, um, some uh, increased wellness questions around social isolation, suicidal ideation, um, and also some uh, questions that may help us get more at that equity issue in regards to health. And so some of those questions will hopefully help us inform our improvement plan um, in the future. 
Um, as far as staffing, uh, we will move another public health staff to a full-time position just temporarily as we continue to concentrate on vaccines. Um, adds for some added backup for those roles as well as for some time off for our other staff. So um, I believe that was something that was approved earlier on as well. Um, Amanda touched on this in her human services report, but certainly a big thank you to the two supervisors and, the, and Amanda in particular. Um, she talked about how the staff are in the right structure and we have the right people in place. And, and I just wanted to solidify after my almost three months here, um, extremely pleased um, to be a part of this team and, and appreciative of all the support that we've had. And I also wanted to mention, I know at our vaccine clinics, the folks that are there in person get a lot of kudos and feedback, but there are so many behind the scenes that you don't see that I just wanted to call them out. They are working on data management, on the hotline, on scheduling, on volunteer coordination. And those folks, folks are Janine, Allison, Christy, Tanya, Cody, and Mark, and Alex. And then also a few other government centers, staff, Steph and Christy. So, so much appreciated. All that work that goes on behind the scenes to get us where we're at. So it looks like it's a seamless effort. Yeah. And then a, a call out to those who are maintaining our COOP as well. Those folks that are continuing to do WIC services day in and day out. And we do have a new staff that started this week to uh, fill a vacancy that um, was from a retirement. So happy that we have those in place. And those are Beth, Cindy, Kristen, Mark, and Christy. Um, and uh, Somadi is the new staff person who started. So hopefully I didn't forget anyone, but much appreciate it with all the work going on behind the scenes. I'm Did pleased to let them know that the board totally appreciates all of their efforts behind the scenes that obviously pass on to them. It's working because your guys' uh, vaccine clinics are just seamless, so. I will certainly do that, thank you. Do you have the slides for this morning as well? And then I'll touch on a quick COVID update. All right, so our 14-day rate, we continue to be kind of in that mid-teen level. We did see just a small little spike coming up, which is not to be um, unexpected as we see things reopen and schools back in person. This is to be expected. Um, we know that this is coming, and we know that hopefully our partners are really um, paying attention to their mitigation strategies. So all good news. We're still, still pretty low. Um, in comparison with our surrounding counties, again, we're, we're doing quite well. Central Minnesota's doing well at this point. We've um, in the past maybe been at higher levels than others, but right now we're kind of in the middle of the pack there, so looks good from that standpoint. The positivity rate continues to be low. We're still in that um, below the caution and high risk state, so people are getting tested and we are not seeing um, really any areas of concern. We do have some little spikes up and down, and again, as we open up and people are in spaces they haven't been in, we expect to see that there might be an increased positivity, at least um, initially. Testing rates, st uh, can, uh, the community continues to be tested. Um, we really don't have any concerns at that. Um, right now, again, we're above that caution level, so as long as people maintain their testing, we should be able to continue our safe uh, reopenings. So for Sherburne County specifically, we've certainly hit some milestones. Um, we here at Sherburne County Public Health have given over 5,000 vaccine doses. So that was a milestone that we all celebrated a bit. Um, we still are under the state average and, and are lower in the amount of distribution that we've had. Um, but we've had some increased explanations from our partners at MDH. And Dr. Morris from Central Care also talked with the Star Tribune and, and talked about some of those factors as well. Um, and I'll go into those a little bit um, in some of the next slides. But I just also wanted to call your attention, we, we did do better with our 65-plus uh, um, population. I think we went up by almost 10% from the last time I was here. So we didn't hit that 70 um, according to the statistics, but I'm guessing we're really close at this point. On that same data page, I just wanted to call your attention on, on this format. It's got the monthly doses administered, 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 excuse me. But you can also look weekly and daily. 
So as that comes up in those reports, you can just kind of see where we're at. So we really continue to get vaccines out. And you'll see dips over the weekend, but then again, it picks up as the week goes on and vaccines are delivered throughout. Again, here at Sherburn County, we've been 100% compliance with that 72-hour turnaround. So we really plan our vaccine uh, clinics um, accordingly so that we can meet those timelines. This week looks a little bit different, and I'm gonna say that because there's only 360 doses scheduled to go out this week, and our last few weeks have been um, 1,000 or more. Um, this week is really concentrated on those food manufacturers, and we were lucky that we um, were actually able to get some of those uh, places in last week as well, so this week it's a smaller allocation to us. Some of our partners around the state who have really large manufacturing um, plants have gotten a large allocation this week. Um, and we know partners at uh, CentraCare and Fairview are helping out with some of those administrations. Um, but we're back at it next week. Next week we have 1,300 doses going out again, and those are our second dose administration. So as we request our doses, we really look at what do we have for second doses and what should we request for a first dose, and then again, what priority population are we focusing on? And as you've heard, we've opened, they've opened that up in Minnesota, so we actually can go on to that tier two and tier three phase as we um, continue to saturate the population. Um, so as we continue up with the food manufacturers, we will have food retailers and other essential workers and those with those underlying health conditions. Uh, to note too, MDH did dig into our data a little bit um, as we were asking more questions about our low rates. And when they looked at it from early March, about 50% of our population has been vaccinated within Sherburn County, and the other 50% has been vaccinated outside of Sherburn County. So really good to know. Um, Hennepin, right, Stearns, and Anoka were the biggest providers of vaccines for outside our, our community. Um, other updates, um, no new news on hospitalizations, although we've heard across the nation, we've seen a few spikes. Um, we continue to watch that, and we also watch for our snowbirds to return, especially from the Florida, Texas area, as they've had more variants there. So we're just kind of watching and seeing what that brings for us here locally. Um, and there's also been uh, some spring breaks. So as those folks return, um, we'll be watching for those cases to pop up as well. There was also some new nursing home guidance by the CDC and really relaxing some of those visitation policies. MDH will continue to look at those policies and then make recommendations for Minnesota. So I would expect in the coming weeks we might see some relaxation in those nursing home settings as well. And I'm not sure if you've heard, but our van will be on its maiden voyage tomorrow at two locations. Um, food manufacturers, um, we uh, asked them if they would be willing to partner with us to help us try out uh, the logistics around using the mobile van for the vaccine. So that will happen tomorrow, and we will give a report back on how well that goes. Perfect. Yeah. Any, question? qu any questions for Nicole? No, no I was just commenting um, how well I think your staff have been functioning in this area. We've mentioned that before, too. But I've heard stories from other counties, and it kind of makes me really appreciate how well you're doing, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you for that. I also forgot the volunteers. We have a fantastic group of volunteers, and they're coming from all over um, to volunteer here. And it has been such a great experience for us, and we really do rely on them. So it, it is fantastic to have them uh, supporting our efforts here. Yeah. yeah, the volunteers are doing a good job. All right, any other questions for Nicole? Thank you very much, and like I said, please tell everybody that we just totally appreciate all of their hard work and everything they're doing. I will pass that on. So, hey. this, yes, Bruce. Wrap, do you want to wrap, or do you want me to wrap up uh, number two there? Yes. Okay. Uh, just to note, also, then, uh, once you're done with the community health board meeting, if uh, you do want to take a short break, mm -hmm. I think Keisha's going to go grab some lunch, and then uh, with the board's permission. Uh, we would recommend taking workshop item three first, the CHR uh, department review. The sheriff's okay with that. He's also going to participate in that conversation or be present. Um, so if that's okay, just because Gary's here and a little respectful of outside support. Um, just a couple of notes for the board. 
Uh, first of all, you'll notice Dan is not here, which is uh, good. Uh, he's taken the break, so um, uh, I'll just give a quick update on the business relief program. We have wrapped it up, and Dan is in the process of doing final reporting to the state for the, uh, the uh, money that we received from the state legislature. I would note there is a, a bill that's been introduced that would redistribute another, uh, I think it's 14 million, that was not spent by deed of that state funding. And the bill would actually redistribute it to counties because counties did such a good job. The additional allocation to Sherburn uh, could be uh, about 300,000. So should that occur, and then Dan, and with the help of the county attorney's office, will probably crack open and look for those eligible businesses that still did not receive the amount that they could have been eligible for. Um, there is some discussion that there will there'll be an opt out for counties because several counties just don't have the capacity to do that or they've finished their program. But at this point, it is, it is an active target, even with what we've considered now a closed program. And then second, a note uh, has, been, has been commented on, the federal uh, uh, package has been approved. There's been a lot of discussion about what it means, what it entails. We're starting to kind of pour through that and we'll have an upcoming discussion with the board. In your packet, I think, is the best summary I've found of a kind of an item-by-item description of that federal program. Uh, and obviously, the nice news is we have three and a half years uh, with which to construct it. Uh, the challenge will be how we proceed, but at least a sense of immediacy, like not even uh, you know an emergency is off. So there's a sense of urgency to get a conversation going about it, but not emergency. Um, so probably even as early as the next board meeting, we'll want to have a a workshop to discuss the federal program and what you folks would like to do with that. And that's uh, that's kind of it for the COVID update. All right. Madam Chair. Yes. I have a couple of things I want to just g kick out for the board to be thinking about here. You know, it's been over a year ago since I signed the emergency declaration. And I'm not sure that we really fit that structure anymore. And I think that we should be reviewing that and discussing if, if that's a, a, a command structure that we need. Also, in the governor's recommendations last week, he has uh, returned to work, does not mandate people not returning to work as of April 15th. And I think that we should be discussing and thinking about getting the oars back in the water again here and uh, moving things along the way they were as much as we can from before. And we may be able to pick some oars out of the water and let people work from home and do those sorts of things, but I think that we should be concentrating our efforts on bringing people back to work. We've offered vaccines to all employees at this point, and I think it's time for us to, to make the call that we're going to uh, move forward. We see, the, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. Fortunately, it's not a train. So. Yes, and it's not the train running, it's over. So that's, and I think that's, I, I think that's a discussion we need to have as a board and, and, and consider what we're gonna do there. Good points, thank you. Got those down, Bruce? Yes, and in fact, as, as was mentioned at the last board meeting, you know, staff level, we were thinking July 1st. That's even been moved up now to, to June 1st for internal discussions to bring to you a plan. Um, again, there's some school issues that we're trying to manage and uh, some recent staffing issues, but uh, Commissioner Schmissing is right on point. Uh, the emergency order also came up. Uh, as, a, as a discussion point simply because the governor's emergency order is still in place, but the relaxing has occurred, but clearly we haven't used the command structure for quite a while. So um, we'll, we'll get both of those on next meeting's agenda. I wonder if I could just add to that. I would, I would hope that we are not uh, aligning our work schedules with what may be happening in our schools. I mean, I think our schools need to, need to get started again too, but I, I think that the two are, are not the same. Uh, I think we should be trying to get folks back here as quickly and if April 15th is the date that it's allowed, then we should be shooting for that and discussing yep. that. Yep. And we'll develop several options for you then you can Yeah, because I'm, I'm pretty positive that um, um, Big Lake and Becker are the last two school districts to go back and they'll be starting um, this today. Thursday. Today? Um, not today. I think is it a it's, week from today? It's, yeah, it's next Thursday. Okay. So just so you know then, because Elk River's been in now for how long, Tim? A while. Yep, and I think St. Cloud is as well, and um, Princeton too. Mm -hmm. So I think all the schools are ramped up and they'll be in place. So I think 
I agree with what um, Felix is saying. We should be able to move that up. Sure. Okay. All right. Anything else before we adjourn the community health board meeting and take a break? Um, Ten minute break. We come back for the workshop at um, what, eleven twenty-five. Sounds good, Don. And Keisha, I love this.